I had a very rough childhood uh, in terms of a lot of violence and uh, FGM and control and I always felt like the weird one in the family, uh, the black sheep. <laughs> I was born a Muslim, raised a Muslim and now I'm an ex-Muslim and an activist for women's rights, especially ones that have left or are still in the religion of Islam. When I start to wear hijab and looking to my brother, he, why I wear hijab and my brother not? And then I look to my mom, why she have to get out like this way? And then, you know, but I, I ask myself, I don't want to, to discuss that with anyone. I only ask myself um, until I start to wear burqa, full uh, covering. Um, I get this feeling, it's, it's not my clothes, but I have to do it for Allah, for my family, for the society. We were brought up, I always call it this Muslim bubble, um, because we went to a Muslim school, we were involved in the community, and then we didn't know any other non-Muslims. Um, the only non-Muslims we knew were on TV, um, so we just weren't mixing with anyone that had a different point of view, although there were slight, obviously, different points of view in terms of within the community. Um, I always felt like my school, my teachers and my friends had a stricter Islam, which I for a very long time thought was the real Islam. Like that music was haram, um, you know, plucking your eyebrows was haram, um, you know, all these kind of slightly different things that my parents were a little bit more relaxed on and more moderate sort of Muslim. Um, but yeah, but I was very much within a community that were quite strict. Um, yeah. Being a Pakistani woman and being an ex-Muslim, first of all, I will say it's such a dangerous combination. It's not uh, safe for you. If I say I'm from Pakistan, then people think you must be Muslim because there is a tag which has been always attached to you, to your personality when one is born in a Muslim country or in a Muslim family. Uh, I was also raised in a Muslim family, a religious family, but there were always questions in my mind that why there are few things which uh, continuously uh, yeah, pinching my mind and they were just pointing out different things. But I was not supposed to ask questions openly because it was forbidden. After I turned about 10 or 11, uh, my father joined a Tablighi Jamaat or a, like part of the Deobandi movement and he got involved with that and he enrolled me into, into an Islamic school. Um, and the, I was really heartbroken about it because I wanted to go to the school that offered horse riding. Um, and that I, I was really looking forward to, go to going to that school, but then like halfway through summer, my father was like, we're sending you to an Islamic school. And I was like, okay. My family is uh, Shia, we're Shias, and it's the Jaffrey Shias. So at the community is called the Koja Shia Ethnashari Jamaat. So growing up in that community, because everybody knew my dad, they all sort of knew me, they knew whose daughter I was and it was, it was a big, like, I think it's over 10,000 people in Tanzania that just directly knew my dad. Um, and the community is very, it's, it's filled with quite a bit of gossip. So if one person knows something, there were messages of, when I came out in public, there were messages about me and they're like, this girl, the daughter of this person is now an atheist. Let's pray for her to come back to Islam. So from a golden child, I went to like being a black sheep only because despite being the same person, I just disbelieved. Being a woman, that was also very difficult for me to understand that why the Islam has given so much uh, less rights to a woman, but not a man. So men was granted more and more power, but woman is like, she has nothing actually in Islam. If we study Quran uh, closely and observe the things, what, what is happening, and also in the society, people treated uh, women 
such as uh, yeah, a little creature. I mean, it's not a, maybe it's not a nice word to say, but it is the situation in the Muslim countries. So when I got to know, well, I was always uh, being asked by my family if I prayed five times a day or not, if I fast or not, if I covered my head or not. I was not supposed to talk to any stranger in the street. I was not supposed to come in front of any cousin. I was not supposed to make new friends, even though no friends. And also my marriage at very early age when I was a school going girl. So I always heard from my family, once you are married, then you can do it and everything with the permission of your husband. And I was happy, okay, I'm just gonna have at least some free freedom. I'm sorry. But yes, it was not the situation. The situation was changed. My husband, he was like more religious than my, than my family. So things were uh, not getting better. They were getting worse day by day. I was forced to do whatever he wanted me to do. So it was the initial stage and it was the initial step to think about taking some decisions over Islam, over religion. And then I renounced my religion. I renounced Islam. I remember that I was always a little bit, um, a little bit rebellious against uh, certain things. Um, I didn't like praying. Um, madrasa for me was uh, torture. Uh, I remember I used to skip madrasa to go to uh, sing for uh, the president of Kenya uh, school choir because that was better. <laughs> the president of Kenya at the time uh, was a dictator. But I remember I used to skip madrasa to go um, and participate in school choir. Um, I also remember uh, hijab was forced on me when I was about six or seven, around the time I had FGM done on me. And I remember uh, sort of just pulling my hijab on door handles and just to tear it apart a little bit just so that you know it's it, I did it, I didn't like it so I just but I couldn't like outrightly drop it so I was like make sure it got on the door handle and it got torn <laughs> and um, so there was that streak of rebelliousness and then there was a period where um, I felt like I had brought so much shame and so much rebellion to my family um, that I wanted to go back to believing and so I, I became a briefly uh, religious uh, re reading the Quran and trying to understand it and but it didn't last very long it just kind of confirmed for me what I was running away from Islam is like part from, from your life because we study it like something really important from when we are like really seven or eight years. Um, so in this time, I think no one can s asking or why I live like this way, why I believe in this God, why it's really difficult to make your mind it's waking up and start to ask. I started wearing a headscarf when I was eight years old. Uh, my parents never forced me, but it was expected of me that when I turned nine, I had to wear a headscarf. Um, so I wanted to be a good girl and I was like, I want to be a good Muslim. I'm going to start wearing the hijab at, eight, like at, eight, at age eight. Yeah, so I felt like I was representing Islam when I was speaking to people, especially because I wore the hijab and I wore it back at this point because I wanted to be like a cool, hip Muslim and show how amazing Islam is and how relaxed Islam is, you know. And you can interpret it a different way. I definitely, by that point, interpreted things, as I said, a little bit more Sufi and a little bit more spiritual and it's metaphorical. Um, that's how I understood it at that point. Um, so I always felt like I had to kind of be like, yeah, I'm Muslim, but I'm cool. Like it was constantly me kind of telling people that. Um, and so, yeah, so I really wanted to spread Islam. And what that started basically was a lot of discussions of, you know, I was speaking to 
many people just kind of asking questions, well, what about Aisha? How come, you know, how come the prophet, your prophet married a little kid? And it was like, oh, okay, uh, let me go away and learn why that happened and then come back and, and face that. Um, and then it was kind of, I would come back and say, well, actually she was 18 and like, you know, it's just wrong. Um, you know, there's lots of kind of counter arguments that I would come back with. And I think after saying all the counter arguments many, many times, I, I'd rehearsed them pretty much. Um, they started to kind of, I started to say it to people and then as I was saying it, realized how stupid it was. The other thing that was alien to me while I was like this practicing as a child was that I didn't really have a concept of love or what love was. I just thought it was, you know, this thing that kept you in a family. You know, it just, your family loves you and that's it. Um, and I remember writing things like that because I was a, quite an avid writer. I used to write, on, I used to post on writing sites. I used to write a lot of poetry. Um, and I used to, I, I wrote this long monologue about how I don't think love exists. And I think that love is just a condition that people make once they're put together. Um, and I didn't have that concept until I left. And it was, once I felt it, it was such an uncomfortable experience for me because I didn't know what was going on. I, I didn't know what it was or how to handle it or, and, and all of my friends kind of, because when I felt it, it, it had visibly changed me. And all of my friends were looking at me like, this is normal. But for me, it wasn't normal at all. And I had never experienced it. And I didn't know that that was, sorry, that was something that I was missing out on. When I was in Kenya, I already used to, I was aware of Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain uh, with Mariam and I used to follow Mariam's work. Um, and also, you know, I was aware of Ayan Hirsi's work uh, as well. Um, and then when I moved to the Netherlands, I remember searching if there's a similar thing. Uh, I saw that there's a humanist, humanist alliance here called the Humanitish for Bond. So I contacted them and I attended one meeting. Um, and when I attended this one meeting, um, one of the ladies was like, oh, by the way, did you know that uh, there's an upcoming conference where Mariam Namazi is going to be speaking? I was like, that's my hero introduce me <laughs> so yeah and, and I wrote to Mariam and um, uh, that's that and I said I, I think I want to come out I think I'm ready I'm shit scared but I think I'm ready and she said yeah do it and then yeah that one thing led to the other and here we are the first thing I started really looking into was the hijab and that was, I think, the first doubt. Because, as I said, I was really trying hard to be a cool Muslim. So I made friends with, all my friends were actually not Muslim apart from one. Um, and we had like our little kind of crew and they were like, let's go on holiday together. And I was like, yeah, I'm gonna be a cool Muslim. I'm gonna go on holiday with them. This, this is fine. This, because Islamically, in the back of my mind, I was thinking I can't really go without a mahram, but w this is fine. I was trying to tell myself, It'll f I'll figure it out. Um, uh, and, we went to Italy together and, uh, you know, there were so many times where I was feeling like I was, again, the guilt was coming. Um, but there was this one day we were on the beach and like obviously on the beach in Italy, everyone's kind of in bikinis, sometimes topless. And I was there with my little burkini, kind of fully covered, looking really odd. Um, and then my friends were in their bikinis. So I was kind of like trying to act like I was confident in my burkini, like, this is what I'm supposed to do. But as I was sitting there, I was looking around and I was thinking like, these women that are wearing a lot less than I am are actually getting less attention, but also I understood in that moment that, you know, there isn't this kind of like guys going crazy and like, it's not chaos. It's not kind of like, these men aren't like animals where they're gonna like pounce on you and you, and I really started to think about that. And that moment really stayed with me because I realized, hold on, the hijab is to protect us and to kind of, you know, our modesty is supposed to, you know, all the things I used to say is like, we're like a pearl, we're beautiful, we're too beautiful to be seen. And if men see us, I don't really know what the other side is, but it's just this expectation that men can't handle it, I guess. Um, so that, I understood it as, hold on, in the West where people are a lot more naked, the men are a lot more respectful. 
And if I were to go to Morocco, where my mother's from, or Egypt, where my dad's from, um, you know, these countries that, that I know, or any other Muslim country, really, uh, even later on I went to Pakistan, you know, even if you just show like a bit of leg, the men go crazy and they stalk you and it's dangerous. It's, it's actually dangerous for a woman to go out on her own and not be hassled by these men. So the concept of hijab as a function in society to protect women and to create this kind of harmonious way of living between men and women actually wasn't working and didn't work. And that was the first thing that I, that, that was my doubt. Cause I was like, how come, how come it's, you know, not having it and having this respect between men and women, regardless of what the hell I'm wearing, you know, there is this respect there. So, so yeah, so then I started to think, well, how can a concept such as hijab, that supposedly from a God, not work? And I studied Quran closely. I observed it and everything, and I got to know, well, it is a man-made. There is nothing, I mean, our supreme power is saying in Quran, go and kill people. I mean, there are more than 100 verses in the Quran which says, go and kill people, kill non-Muslims. Why? A supreme power, how he can do it, how he can say, go and just kill others. So these kind of things, they just changed my mind. Mm -hmm. I was uh, 26, 25. Um, in this time in Saudi Arabia, you don't have anything to do, only to sitting in your room and uh, doing internet, Twitter, Facebook, and other things. So in this time, I was completely uh, outside of this world, I can say. I don't know there is people in our world, they don't believe in God. I don't know there is people in our world, they don't have any religion. And then I was completely shocked. It's, I feel like it's important information, why they hide it, why I don't know it. Um, I was always taught to hate gay people, like, you know, they don't deserve to be a recipient of any dignity. Um, but I couldn't put myself in a position to hate gay people or Jews, only because the book has said so. I'm like, no, they're still people. So it all started with like an empathetic, I, you know, an empathetic mindset and altruism that I couldn't put myself in this position that just didn't like a group of people based on uh, their orientation or their religion. I was really taken aback by the size of the school. It literally was like two, um, it was like ground floor, first floor, and there were like three classrooms when really they were like bedrooms. Um, there was one toilet and we had like a little granite outdoor area that we called a playground. Um, and the school was really excited that we had one interactive board, um, like a whiteboard. They like even put it in the letter that they sent us, like my acceptance letter, which was I found really interesting. Um, but I went along with it and I thought, you know, my dad knows best for me. So I, I went and I was a daddy's girl as well. So I was going to do anything to make him happy. Um, so I, I went along with it. There was no uniform except the jilbab and like a headscarf. But one of my teachers, she was an Islamic studies teacher. She used to cover her face. And I thought that that was like really cool. as like an 11 year old kid that couldn't express anything. <laughs> so um, I, I like looked and I used to ask a lot of questions about it. Like, is it uncomfortable? Like, um, you know, can you take it off anytime? And she would give me answers. She would, she really put up with me as because she was my Islamic studies teacher through all my phases of being a, as like a young Muslim. She really, really put up with me because I would really haze her with questions. Um, and some days she would just get so fed up, she would literally sit me in a corner and say that you need to just be quiet. Um, but I, I used to see her wearing the niqab and it like interested me because I knew I couldn't take off my, you know, my headscarf or my uh, jilbab, but I could put on a niqab, it was an option for me. Um, as like, and I, I had said this on like other podcasts before where people asked me like, were you ever forced to wear it? And I always said that, no, I, I I feel as though I made the choice to wear it, but not for religious reasons. I did it because I thought it was like an identity marker. Like I would have been the only girl in my school to have worn it. And I would have been the only girl in my family to have worn it. And I didn't really have like many other ways of expressing my individuality besides that. Um, but
But obviously, like when I was an 11 year old girl, I would have said, oh, I'm doing it for God, whatever. Um, it wasn't until I turned about 14 that I just continued asking a lot of meddling questions. So in within the Deobandi circles or within Tabliki circles, Sunnis have like four different schools of thought that they adhere to, you know, Hanbali, Shafi'i, Maliki, Hanafi, you know, all of those different schools of thought. And I became aware of a movement that rejected all of these ideas because they were constantly contradicting each other. And my teacher had this idea, so the one, I don't know if I'm over explaining this, but the one concept that my teacher had introduced to me was that when Shafi'is go to Hajj, they actually become Hanafis because they can't do the tawaf without touching a woman. And in, in the Shafi'i school of thought, if a man touches a non-mahram woman, his purity breaks and you can't do the tawaf without being pure. And I thought, but they're already Muslim, so why would they need to convert to another school of thought? That doesn't make any sense. Um, so that was like the, the chink in that armor. And I thought maybe I need to go to a more literalist interpretation. And my, like when I brought it to my father, it just, you could see the sort of psycho spinning in his head and just being like, there's something wrong. Here. <laughs> and he took it to the masjid and he would constantly have arguments and then he would just constantly find other contradictions. Um, and he saw all these like contradictions and he was like, we should definitely move to a more literalist interpretation. And then both myself and my father brought this Salafi hell onto my family and we more or less radicalized everyone to this new school of way of thinking. Our societies like Pakistan and Saudi Arabia and other countries as well, the, the Islamic states, they give such a, sp a little space to women. They think the man is a master of a woman. So a woman, she is always obliged to do what her husband, her father, her son, her brother is saying. And if a woman, she does not follow, then she was in several cases, she was killed in the name of honor. You heard about the honor killing as well. It is really, really normal in Pakistan, in the society of yeah Pakistan. So yeah, I thought, to get more freedom, it is also important for a woman to stand up and speak and to tell the world, well, if you are a woman, it's not a crime, it's not a sin. I, a lot of the reason why I kind of became very religious was definitely to kind of close up that feeling of guilt because of the, you know, the guilt that I mentioned. Definitely it was kind of like, well, the only way for me to get rid of that is to do this properly. I don't want to go to hell and especially if you're brought up from a small child you know we have very scary teachers in retrospect I'm like wow they were really scary people that would teach us at like five years old uh, you're gonna have your hair hung you know um, this every strand that you show you're gonna be hung from that uh, if you show your hair to men um, you know you're gonna burn uh, just all the horrible descriptions of your skin burning and then coming again and you're gonna have to have like lead hot lead poured into your ear and all these weird weird horrible things when you learn that as a child it's so scarring and I think it really stays with you it really does stay with you because and it kind of goes into your unconscious I feel like because it's so traumatic and so dramatic <laughs> that it's like it kind of embeds this fear in you because you've learned it from such a young age as well when you don't know anything. Um, so definitely that was something that was in the back of my mind, kind of like, well, let's avoid that. I feel like the more I get the information, the more I have to be careful because I know I am now different and I have something different in my mind and it will be really dangerous from my family, from the country, from all the society, if someone know what I am going through. <laughs> uh, 2014, my mom was in, always uh, not happy what I am doing in my room all the time. Why I am sitting long? What, what, what's going on with Rana? I think my mom in this time. And she said, let's go to Mecca 
and you will do Umrah with us. And I was like, no, <laughs> don't put me in this situation. You know, when you are atheist or ex-Muslim and someone take you to this place and around you two million, th three million uh, Muslim, you feel completely, <laughs> it's painful. It's, you want to shout? to say, I am atheist, kill me. You know, in this moment, I have this feeling. But in the same time, you have to be happy because you are going in the house of God. <laughs> this is past college now, um, because I had moved out already. Uh, I, I'd rebelled so much that I had moved out before anybody um, had moved out. And something significant happened at the time I was moving out. Um, two two uh, significant things happened. One was I tried to save a child uh, from FGM, which backfired on me. Like, I, I wasn't really able to because I was just uh, just freshly out of college kid. And um, so my family thought that this was, um, I was possessed um, and I needed uh, Rukia. Um, Rukia exorcism um, that I was possessed by evil spirits and those uh, sheikhs were called, imams were called, I was beaten up, I was tied up. Um, I am tying the moving away and this uh, Rukia incident and trying to save the FGM uh, from a four-year-old child because they, they happened so fast together. I tried to save the child. My family was convinced I had de uh, demons and I needed to be exercised, but I also was trying to negotiate to move. And so the two, the negotiating to move and trying to save the child, m I think caused or uh, metamorphosized into me, uh, a Rukia being performed on me. Uh, four days later, I just walked away and I never looked back. It took me a long time to actually come out of the mentality that, um, you know, my body is aura or is in some way shameful in some way. Um, when I was a younger girl and when we were being taught about the hijab, um, it was never presented in a way of, you know, men shouldn't be looking at you. It was always presented in a way where your body is of so much value that men can't look at you. Um, and I think I bought into that, especially as a young person who wanted that kind of empowerment. Um, and it's, it's completely false. It's a complete lie when you go back to scripture and you realize why the hijab is what it is. Um, but when it was first presented to me, uh, I think it was first my Islamic studies teacher and then later through like different lectures by Zakir Naik who would talk about precious diamonds and, and how you lock them away and wear precious diamonds. And it's, just, it's just so misogynistic. But um, it, that's how it was presented to me. And I thought, you know, if, if my body is this valuable that no man outside my family, even my cousins can't look at me, then maybe I should do even more. And that was like more of an argument to wear the niqab, like cover my face. Um, even though initially it was a statement, after a couple of weeks, I was like, okay, made my statement, can I take it off? And then like my, both my father and my Islamic studies teacher made the case that, oh, you know, it, it's so much better because you're hiding even your face, like even your face is, is valuable. Um, so that just made the argument stronger. And I was like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not hurting anyone except me, but um, yeah. And that's how I had fallen into that mentality. But even after I had sort of, because once I became a fundamentalist and I realized what hijab was, even after that, after I'd let those ideals go, that it was like a symbol of women's empowerment, which it absolutely is not. I was still in the mindset that this was something that God wanted. So it was something that I did. Um, I was broke. So I went to live in a, in a, in, a, in a sort of slum area in, in Nairobi, um, uh, renting uh, one room, uh, sharing bathrooms with other people. I had a small uh, income uh, of a sales job or of some sort. I hadn't really gotten into journalism yet. 
And then I, uh, I just like survived on my own like that. And then I, I became a journalist for Kenya Television, uh, Kenya, Kenya Broadcasting Corporation. And I met, um, I met my, uh, the father of my children at that time. There's a British man who, who was on a holiday in, in, in Kenya. And so we just uh, hit it off, and I, uh, but my family didn't agree, so I wanted to stop the love from myself <laughs> and believe in uh, Islam. So that was the period I went back to um, believing. Mid-2017 is when I actually posted up something in public as a progressive Muslim supporting gay marriage. Um, I think I was the first one in my community that I was from that posted up in solidarity with a couple that had gotten married in Canada. Um, and I, I think overnight or over two nights, it got 500 comments and a lot of people hating me for supporting them and asking me to renounce my, rel my religion. And I'm like, wait, hold on. This is not fair. Why are you guys so lethal about it? Like, why, why are you so vile about all of this? Um, and I, you know, went online and I searched peaceful verses about people who don't agree with you or people from different religions. I couldn't find it. There was always a condition. There was always a condition that, oh, as long as they don't go against you, as long as they don't mock your religion, as long as they don't do this. And that led me to think that why am I believing in such a violent religion? I started reading a bit of the history of the battles. The only thing keeping me in the religion was my family or, the, or what they expected of me. Um, and I'm a very, I'm quite blunt. So I went, you know, when I had made up my mind that this is it, no more Islam, I went to my, you know, I went, got on my WhatsApp group chat to my family and wrote, I'm agnostic or atheist. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in Islam and don't know about God yet, but like, I just don't believe in Islam. They thought it was a phase. They thought it would pass. And we kept, we kept our safe distances. We tried debating a little and that would just end up in, you know, all of us getting mad at each other. In terms of how I started um, spreading Islam, I couldn't do it openly as my father did it because he was a man. He could just stand outside and, because he used to go and hang out at uh, Kilburn where they, they do a lot of, um, those kinds of things. Um, but because I was a woman, I couldn't do the same. Uh, you know, my voice is aura, my presence is aura, I, had, I have to stay inside. Aura is uh, like your, I can't, I can't remember what it exactly translates into, but it's basically what's forbidden for men to see. It, it's your, it's what you're meant to be, ash not sh ashamed of, but basically ashamed of. You're meant to cover your body. It's haram for other men to see, and it's haram for you to disclose that to them. So um, what many people don't understand about the hijab is that a lot of people view the hijab as just like the head covering, and it's bad enough as just the head covering. But the hijab has conditions attached to it, like it has to be opaque, it has to be loose, it has to uh, not imitate the disbelievers in any fashion so you can't be wearing like a big cross with it um uh it, uh, it has to be you can't have like all your ornaments showing while you're wearing it it is meant to be a complete erasure of your individuality which was why it's strange that i chose it as individuality um but it, it's meant to take away that from you in the public eye um and you know there are other things stating that if you're walking outside then you shouldn't like wear loud shoes or be banging your feet because that it it's it draws the attention of men you can't wear perfume outside otherwise it's equal to fornication and fornication is a huge sin in islam um your voice you know when you speak if it's not necessary you shouldn't be speaking you shouldn't be singing it, it's aura you're not supposed to be doing it so the whole concept of hell and heaven um, was, yeah, definitely the, the final straw. I felt like that just didn't make sense. And if that didn't make sense, that for me was the entire concept of religion. Um, and then that's when it all kind of just collapsed. And I was like, whoa. And I, ooh, and I, remember, and I remember thinking to myself, I don't know if I believe in Islam. And I kind of kept that for a couple of days. And then I said it out loud to my husband. And I was like, I don't know if I'm Muslim, 
And he was like, what? And I was like, I just, I don't know. And like, he was kind of surprised, but then he, obviously we've been speaking for so many years about this stuff. He was like, okay. And I was like, he was just like, okay. And I was like, what about you? And he was like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm definitely still Muslim. I was like, okay. Um, I was like, that's I was like, are you okay being with me? Cause I'm not Muslim then. Um, and he was just like, well, yeah. And it was just like this weird, <laughs> we just had like an awkward moment of like, this is so weird. <laughs> How did this happen? Because I was the one, just to put it into context, I was the one that was more religious than him. And I was the one that prayed. I mean, I used to be like, you have to pray. How can you not pray? Like, come on. I used to pray the Farad, which is what you have to do, and the Sunnah, which is like an extra. So <laughs> I used to do the extra prayers. Um, and I used to literally kind of tell him to do it. So it was such a switch that we were just like, how did this happen? Um, and then uh, I kind of, in my heart, I felt like he didn't really believe because we, we've been talking about it for so long, but then he just didn't want to admit it. And he did admit it eventually. Uh, for a woman, of course, it is not easy to get divorced because uh, again, the religion has so many boundaries for several things, for women especially. So it is really easy for a man to say three times, talaq, talaq, talaq means divorce, 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 and the relationship ends. But a woman in Islam, that was uh, something, you know, it's, uh, it's not normal. So she needs to ask her husband, that just give her a divorce. But my husband, in that situation, my ex-husband, he was not agree with that because he wanted to be with me. So he could torture me. So he could be with me and he could accuse me in blasphemy law as well because he got to know that I am no, no more Muslim. I am ex-Muslim. I spoke things about Islam which were not allowed. But then I decided, no. I'm not going to tolerate all these things. I was educated, even though I was stopped uh, to go to school. But then still, I had my mind. There were several things in my mind that, yes, I could do. I'm a woman. I'm not weak. I'm a powerful. So I thought, it's enough. I'm not going to bear it at all. I'm not going to tolerate it anymore. And then I just ran. I went to court and I asked them, I'm not gonna leave this man anymore. And then I got divorced from the court. But uh, then again, he tried to prove several things against me in the court. And he said, well, I am a characterless. My character is loose. And he also said, I am an ex-Muslim. I spoke things about, uh, about Islam. And uh, I'm a blasphemer and everything. So it was, the, it was something really uh, yeah, difficult for me because by using those kind of arguments, he just took the custody of my daughter. She was only three years old at that time. And then court granted custody of my daughter to him. So it was a plus point for him, but it was really difficult for me because after that moment, I was not able to meet my daughter. I was not able to see her anymore. I was not supposed to talk to her. I was not allowed because he had court orders and I had nothing. I tried to fight again, but yeah, I didn't succeed. A number of things had happened in my life that I feel as though affected my level of belief at different times. So my mother had passed away when I had just turned 18. Uh, my father kind of really, really broke my, he's like one of the only people who has truly broken me. Um, you know, I lost my faith in Islam and it took a long time for me to lose my faith in Islam because I, I felt as though Islam was one of those things that was keeping me going through all of the things that were happening. You know, I witnessed someone committing suicide, well, attempting suicide in my house. Thankfully, I don't believe she passed away. Um, you know, being completely ostracized by my family because I had decided to report my father because he was abusive. Um, I had gone through several different stages of part homelessness and full homelessness, um, you know, losing my siblings. And, and that's just like the summary. 
Um, there were like a number of things that affected me. And then like after losing religion, I had just become a walking husk of myself because I thought I was doomed and I was just going to burn in hell. I was six years old. Um, I remember very vividly. Um, as much as later on when I read about uh, you know, how uh, child development and, and at what points do you start developing, you know. Uh, uh, I don't remember much else about my, my childhood up to maybe 10, but I really remember FGM um, and wh what happened and what happened that day and what I was told and how you know, you're kind of scared. Um, but you, it's so n normal where you live. And at that time, my six-year-old brain, it was, it was the normal what happens. Like nothing of the other metamorphosis that happened to my brain later had already ha had happened. So it was, it was like I, I, I was only scared of the physical uh, pinch, because uh, they tell you it's a pinch. Uh, but I remember the emotions that went through me as I grew older and realizing what was taken from me and why was it taken from me. And having these questions and this anger and this emotion and saying, why the hell did they do this to me? And trying to understand it and trying to understand whether it was culture or whether it was religion and so many people saying, no, it's just an African culture and finding all these hadiths and, and that justify it and me saying, no, this is wrong. That I don't like a religion and, 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 and a society that tells me that this is okay for this to be done to me. Yeah, so that, I, I guess that, that then led to the, um, to the completely just, I, I remember I just, for me, rejecting Islam was in phases of rejecting certain things that had happened to me. I rejected violence, I rejected FGM, I rejected all these things and I, all of them I thought that they were wrong and then finding that they have something to do with my society, my culture, my religion, my upbringing and going and saying that no. It shouldn't be like that. We started this uh, organization at Eastern Agnostic Alliance Pakistan in 2012. Uh, after divorce, I got to know uh, yeah, my uh, husband now, Sayed Gilani. So we got to know each other. I was working in an in a office. Uh, yes, I'm telling you the situation about uh, after the divorce. So I got to know that, okay, there is one new colleague in my office and he's also working with me. So we uh, interacted and we got to know each other. And I got to know, well, he is also an ex-Muslim, but we both were so afraid. I told you already to be in a Pakistan and to be an ex-Muslim is really dangerous. So he had also some reservations and me too. We were not uh, speaking publicly and we were even not saying anything to each other. But we got to know, we got some uh, hints in our mind that yes, he's ex-Muslim and he also got to know, well, she is something uh, which makes her really separate from other people. Because then I was not taking a job, I was not covering myself. I was working in an office that was an advertising agency and I was an uh, event manager there. And then uh, time was passing and then we started meet each other and we uh, started talking over, over things, over random things in general, who you are, what you do, so what's your background. And then we both came to know that, okay, we can trust each other. And then he told me, well, I'm also an ex-Muslim. And I was like, what? Yes, me too. So it was such a party time for us because that was, uh, yeah, I mean, I found someone like-minded. So I found someone who can really understand me. And I suppose that he too. And then we thought, well, if we both are the same, we are thinking in the same way, then there might be other people as well. Then we thought, okay, why don't we start an organization 
for the people, the like-minded people, the ex-Muslims, but we were also afraid. I couldn't tell people face to face. I couldn't be like, hi, I'm like, by the way, I just couldn't do it. So I just made this video, why I left Islam, and I put it on YouTube. <laughs> and then I actually put the link on my Facebook. Um, and then I was like, let's just see what happens, which was such a weird way of doing it now in retrospect. Um, but I suddenly got like this wave of like messages and like horrible emails and like phone calls and it was like chaos. I mean, I actually had taken the video down about five times and put it back up and put it, I had to keep making it private because I was like, oh, what should I do? You know, this is, it was such a difficult kind of crazy thing. So the community as well as the, the ones I mentioned before that I was very much involved in, who, by the way, were already annoyed that I'd taken off my hijab. <laughs> just that, just that was a bit like, well, what is she doing? Um, you know, she's, she's, maybe she's going through a weird phase. So they just never expected that it would be I left Islam. Um, so I had different reactions. You know, some people were thinking maybe she's having a breakdown like her dad did. Maybe she's just copying her dad, you know, because whatever. Um, and a lot of people, including my mum, uh, kind of thought it must be kind of magic. Um, you know, there must be, you know, I mean, depression anyway, because my dad was depressed and um, she had this image of like, he had a magic on him. So that's what, how she, she understood my dad had magic on him and he became depressed and that's how he left. So she thought if he had magic, my daughter must also have magic. So somehow that made sense to her. I want to cry, I can't because they hear me, they are, around, they are around me, my family. I want to shout, I want to do anything to make any reaction, you know, when you are really sad and but someone put something uncovering and close it. You can't, you can't do any reaction, you can't cry, you can't do anything because you will be really killed if someone know you are a feist. And I decide in this night I will do this paper, but I was not really sure, you know. I know it will be really dangerous, but I want to do, I want to do that. I bought the paper and I bought a pen on my bag and then we go to Mecca. And when we start to, to move around the, the Kaaba, I told my mom, I am going to toilet. I have to go and I will back quickly. And she told me, yeah, we, we will meet in this uh, place. I try to find place when I, where I can write to quickly and take a photo and notice where is the camera. I walk like from the people and no one notice I am doing something not fine. And I find place, they are building this place, something broken or something like this. And I write it quickly and I take it from the notebook and I do it like this in my hand. I remember this moment, moment when I took a, this photo I was shocked from myself what I did. <laughs> no one should have to go through the same experience as I did, you know, with the, the physical abuse, the verbal abuse, the ostracism, you know, the homelessness, um, and, you know, the constant mind games of being like, oh, you can be with us, but you can't be with us, but you can be with us, but you can't be with us. You know, the, the manipulation tactics that I had to use just to go about my day, living two lives. Actually, one day, a uh, few people, a mob actually, you can say, they just chased us. They reached to our location and they got to know where we are living, me and my husband, uh, uh, Gilani, and they attacked on our home. So they just, uh, yeah, it was such a scary situation. I, I still remember. So we both, we ran away from the home. Um, without knowing that where we are going because yeah at that moment we were just blank and we got to know that it's really gonna be difficult and risky for us it's a dangerous situation but we just ran away and we uh, went to one of our friends home and there we stayed and to be in the Netherlands it was really accidentally because I was not knowing at that moment where I am uh, uh, going but yes there was no other uh, way for me uh, except to get out from Pakistan
because if I just stay there, uh, they could be, uh, you know, assassinated me. So that was really, really scary situation for me. But we managed and uh, then I left Pakistan uh, with a heavy heart, of course, because that was my hometown. I spent my childhood there. There were a lot of memories. My daughter, she was also there. Uh, my husband, Sayyid Gilani, he was at that moment also there because we couldn't manage to, to, yeah, to flee together. But yes, it, it happened. And then I just reached here to the Netherlands. I asked my manager, and this time I work in the school, and my manager, he can give me the uh, allowedness, uh, permission to travel. So I told him that my mom wants to travel to Lebanon to visit someone from our family, and we ne I need you to sign the paper. My dad is not here, and he believed me, and he signed it, and he gave it to me. And even though I did this plan, um, the immigration office, they sent some paper uh, to my school because they need also the sign from my father. And I did it, and I signed it, and I signed it. You know, I want to go to maximum, even if I die, I try hard to get out. Um, and everything work. And now I have my passport, my ticket, everything ready. I remember the last week, I remember the last day with my family when my mom cooked uh, the lovely es uh, the, the, the essence I love, it's kapsa. She cooked it before I leave, before one day. And I was sitting with my family, my father, my brother, all they sitting and eating together. I was eat and say bye bye. I will miss you mom. And then I eat, I will miss you dad. And then I eat, I will miss this time. I want to cry, but I have to be really normal really someone different in this moment. Not doing anything with my feeling, keep it secret. It was hard for me, but I have to do it like this way. Because she was so beautiful. You know, she was so, such a cute little cuddly thing. And she was four years old. And they had already arranged um, the circumciser to come to the house and I I just couldn't I couldn't put myself I, I I think I was subconscious it was a subconscious decision to save her wasn't a calculated to try to save her wasn't a calculated thing it was more like I just want to take her out of this situation right now uh, without knowing like you know uh, you know I didn't even think of like to to call the police because FGM is also illegal in Kenya even though in practicality you know um there's a lot of problems um so i just took her out of the house and i went uh i was gone the whole day brought her back at around 7 p.m uh everybody was pissed off with me uh the mother was pissed off with me the um, entire flat i could say was pissed off with me um, it was a big deal. I was, um, uh, there was violence towards me because of that. Um, and the child got done in the end. And that fucked me up because um, I couldn't save her. And the picture of her is, is traumatic for me because I, even, I don't know how I moved around with this picture, to be honest with you, but I found it in my old stuff. And she's now an adult. I don't have contact with her, but it haunts me and it keeps on bugging me and I do bit myself about it a lot. Even though as an adult, I know in the situation I was in, I really couldn't save her. But I don't know, it just has that, effect and emotion attached to it, I guess. But in the year of 2014, 2015, he had gotten married again. And like the first week or so, everything was fine. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure what was the instigator, but the second week, he just constantly complained about her. And by that point, I was used to him rambling and I was kind of just zoned out of it. But he kept, he kept complaining about her and I asked him 
you married her a week ago. Did you just think that it was going to be plain sailing? And he looked at me and I hadn't realized that that was the first time I'd ever like actually spoken back to him. After like about three weeks, he completely isolated her. He completely resigned her to one room in the house. He didn't want her on the same floor as him at any point in the day. Um, the only time that she could come down was when he was out of the house and I would like make her food and bring it up to her room. We actually set up a bed in my room where there were four of my other siblings living with me. Um, and we set up a bed for her and she would be crying every night. She would want to call her brother who was back in Bangladesh. And it was just like this really horrible experience. And then when he finally did divorce her, which was just a simple talaq, um, well, that's what Muslim men say to divorce their wives. It just means I divorce you. Um, she locked herself in the bathroom and she tried to kill herself. Um, and he was out of the house. He didn't want to, he didn't want anything to do with it. So I was left to deal with it. I called my uncle. I called the ambulance. I tried to get the door open. I actually climbed out of my house to try and get into the window, which was not on the ground floor. It was on the upper floor. Um, like I, I tried everything I could to save this woman. The ambulance took her and I, I believe she got her stomach pumped and she survived. But after my father heard the story, he was making jokes and laughing about it. And I couldn't understand how one human being could be like that to another human being. Like forget everything else. This woman nearly died in your house. Um, and that's when I decided, like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. Like, I can't make excuses for you. And the sort of the physical abuse had started that year. So the January of 2015 with me. Um, so he would hit me for tiny little things. Like there was one time where I was cooking fish and I like put too much oil in the pan. And he had just, he had slapped me so hard that I fell on the floor. Um, and then it just consistently got worse. Many people were just kind of, uh, you know, just telling me basically, you know, we, we need to have a conversation. I think at first actually it was, we need to have a conversation, come meet me. Um, my aunt, who I was very close to actually, um, she was like a second mother to me. She kind of said to me, uh, we need to talk, but I can't have you in my house anymore because, you know, that, you know, I can't, I can't kind of host you, but let's meet in a coffee shop because I need to talk to you. Um, and so we had a conversation um, and she said to me, you know, actually I want to speak to you because on the day of judgment, Allah will ask me, why did I not kind of speak to you and bring you back? So it wasn't even for me, it was for her, <laughs> for her and back. Um, and she said, you know, I have to, you know, tell me what your problem is with Islam and I'll tell, I'll, I'll do it right now. I'll tell you everything right now. We'll close this and you can take down the video and forget it. And I was like, oh, how am I, like, it's a 40 minute video. Like, how am I going to go through all the things that I disagree with? And, and I had a lot of that, a lot of like, what is it? What is it? Why? Why? Come on, let's talk about it. Um, you know, kind of as if they're going to kind of solve the problem. Uh, but as I said, I, I, I kind of understood it because I'd been there. So I was trying to be understanding. And I remember just saying to my aunt, like, she was saying actually horrible things to me. She was saying, you know, like, what you're doing is disgusting and I can see shaitan in your face and, um, you know, all these kind of horrible things. And I hadn't said anything and I just said, I love you. I just want to say that. Um, and then I was like, I, this is how I feel. I, I can't really explain it to you, but th this is just, this is just what it is. I, I knew it wasn't going to go anywhere to have a debate with her, especially her mentality and stuff. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to be like love, peace, happiness. This is what I'm about. If you want to kind of be like spouting hate to me, then that's kind of on you. Um, but then I was like, I said to her in that moment, I don't want anything to change between us though. Like our relationship shouldn't change. I, her daughters have been like sisters to me. So, and she was like, of course this changes everything. Of course this does. And I remember just having my heart like sink because I just thought, wow, it really is going to change. And 
So I, I haven't seen her or spoken to her or her daughters. They've all kind of immediately blocked me off Facebook and they just kind of cut me off. And these are people that I spent like a lot of my life with and grew up with. I was their bridesmaids, you know, they were my bridesmaids. <laughs> so it's like very, very close people to me. So, um, and then it was just like continuously having people like drop, drop like flies, you know, just kind of like, we can't hang out with you. Like this is done. After they attempt to convert me. So it's like, in their mind, they're like, we'll try. Um, and then it's like, this isn't gonna work. Um, and then more videos were going up on my channel about Islam. And then some people were saying to me, we could have maybe coped with it, but because you're speaking openly about Islam and openly, you know, if you can just take all your videos down, then we can be friends. Um, so one person said to me, actually, a cousin of mine, who I was also very close to, said to me, you know, we can be friends, but to be honest with you, I won't treat you the same as you were. You know, in my mind, I was thinking, so I'm like a second class citizen now, sort of thing. I moved here as the wife of somebody who later on also became uh, violent. And I remember having the conflict of, um, I thought I was running away from my background and then I found myself in the same situation. And I wrote more poetry and now this, this time I came out with the poetry. Um, I started attending reading places, uh, booking myself into little gigs here and there uh, in and out around Amsterdam. Um, but I still wasn't comfortable to connect all my identities together. Uh, only very recently when I came out as an ex-Muslim here at the Bali, I was like, all of this is me, so I'm just gonna all embrace all of it. I was living in the asylum seeker center. Our case was in the process. We need to tell each and everything what has happened with us, what was the situation. The asylum seeker center was also not a safe, uh, safe place for us. We faced many questions because at that time, I remember the asylum centers were also full of Muslim people, the religious people. They came from different countries and they were also, if they confronted us, they asked us question when they got to know, I am from Pakistan, then I must be Muslim. So they asked some, uh, you know, uh, different questions. And when I tell them, well, I am from Pakistan, but I'm not Muslim, then the reaction was, quite uh, yeah, uh, dangerous for me because people, they just look at me uh, from head to toe. Well, you are from Pakistan, you must be Muslim. This is the mentality, this is the ideology. Um, so the kids were watching cartoons. I was sleeping on the sofa. There was some mess on the floor. There was like cornflakes on the floor. And I was just, you know, it was like, I was up since 5 a.m. in the morning. I hadn't slept all night because I have two babies sleeping next to me um, and I was just resting in the living room and my I, I knew my father didn't wake up very early he his depression had led him to sleep through most of the day so he would wake up at like 12 11 12 o'clock and it was about nine o'clock so I didn't think that he would just you know walk in but he walked in and he saw all of this um, you know the what I just described and he just lost it. He completely brutalized me in front of my very young siblings. Um, and when I say brutalized, I mean brutalized. I had pictures to show the police because it was that bad. Um, I was bedridden for about a day and he thought that an apology by way of making food was going to be enough for me to forgive him for that. But it truly was the... It, it truly felt like I had been stabbed in the back by my best friend, the person that I trusted the most in the world. And I reported him for that. And it was, even if it was necessary, it was one of the most difficult things that I had to do. Because it, to me, it felt unnatural, but I didn't know what else to do. I had told my family members and they had just sort of been like, well, this happened to all of us. And it was something that I just had to grunt and bear. And I think that one of my uncles had tried to stage an intervention, but it was, a sh it was just a sham. It was completely a show. It, it wasn't something, it was just to appease me and make me feel better. It wasn't to actually make a change. And they thought that I would buy into that for whatever reason. 
But I had gotten back into contact with the social worker and I sent her the pictures and I said, this is what happened. And as soon as I told the social worker, I told one of my aunts that I was reporting my father. And I had, for over a few months, I had like preemptively packed a bag because I, I foresaw myself leaving that house. So I had like all my papers, all my necessary clothes, and I had even packed a prayer mat because I wasn't, I hadn't left Islam by that point. Um, but my aunt had called me and told me to tell the police that I was emotional and that was completely untrue. My grandma had called me and told me the same thing. And I told them that I'm not going to do that because I've, I've, I've done it. I've done it. And I'm not going to take it back. And it, they, so the day that I contacted the social worker was actually a weekend. So she didn't see the message until Monday. And I was saying with this knowledge that I had reported my father, I had decided to tell my sister, um, who's 10 years younger than me, what I had done. And she said, what's going to happen to us? And I said, I don't know. Because I didn't know. And I was really scared that my entire family was going to be divided into other houses, but I also thought that that was better than them living in that house. And we went through so many things in that house. Like, it was never warm. We had gotten... It was so cold that it, we had gotten frostbite on our toes in winter. Um, my father would cook food on one day of the week and it would go off by the end of the week and we would still have to eat it and I would still have to feed it to the kids and if the kids didn't eat it and they were very small kids they were, you know, my brothers were babies um, he would beat them like, and, and not just like a slap on the wrist not that that is in any way acceptable for a, a baby but he would beat them as if you know, they had any mode to understand what they were being beaten for. Um, and it, it was such a harsh environment and I hated every single minute of it. But my devotion to my God and my devotion to my father had prevented me from doing anything for so long. And I don't know how to had to overcome the fact that I allowed that to happen for so long. I miss my father too much. Sometimes I cry when I hear like a girl saying Baba or um, I feel why I have to lose him, why I have to miss him, why I have to cry, why I have... Sorry. <laughs> It's hers. You know, my family was aware of all the things that were happening in my home and they dismissed it. They offered me one solution and the one solution was to get married. Um, and I didn't want to do that because I didn't want to leave my siblings in a home where they were in constant danger. Um, and that is by no means an exaggeration. I had, go had grown very, very acute to the danger that was there. Um, like I would be able to tell apart my father's footsteps in the street outside my house. I could hear him coming. Um, and I don't think that that's something normal that most people do when they think about their fathers. It was just this constant dread of him coming home. Um, and I had reported him and on the day that the police were going to come, my aunt had decided to tell one of my uncles who had come to my house and had more or less hazed me on why I had reported my father. Um, and I told him I did it because he had severely beaten me and these beatings have been going on for a while, well, not just with me, but all of the kids. And on the day that he had beaten me as severely as he had that time, he was screaming around the house that he was going to kill all of the kids. And I, you know, I, I reported that. 
and my uncle just gave me a good talking to and told me I'm immature and that that was something very childish for me to do and I told him so I'm immature but you think that I'm mature enough to look after five children and he said well you're not, you're immature about the outside world and I was I, I said to him well you're all mature people and you decided to do nothing and I did something and he looked at me as though you deserved that beating like this is what you've been doing in the house like you you fully deserve that beating and I was like that's your opinion but it's done now and it's gonna happen I'm not gonna change my mind on it and I just sort of left him and I went and hid in my room and he told my father and my father started a screaming match with me and he was like if you didn't want to live in this house you could have just left and I I said okay then I'm leaving and I took out my bag and he was very surprised that I already had a bad bag packed and all my all my papers were in there and everything um and the police came they separated us and they put me in one car and they drove me to the station and I'm like forever grateful because they they were the only people who were around that said that was very difficult to do and we're glad that you did it. And they said that we're going to try and find somewhere for you to stay tonight. But if you can't find somewhere to stay, then you can just stay in the police station. No one really from the West Country can, can imagine how Islam can hurt you and hurt your family and uh, completely damage your life. And that's what happened to me. If my family not a Muslim family, why I have to suffer all these years to be free and have my rights, I'd be happy. Why I have to live with my family with this feeling. I am afraid from my family because I am not a Muslim anymore. How you can describe this moment for the West country when they are not a Muslim, when they don't live in the Muslim society, when, the, when they are not growing up there, how they can understand what we are saying. It's like what happened to me, they are really in other world and they don't want to hear us. It's more difficult for a woman because of, you know, the way that women are viewed in Islam, basically. You know, we, we, we're meant to be the kind of, the mothers of, of the next generation and we have to teach them and we have to wear hijab and we have to cover from men and we have to be virtuous and the first thing that people say to me is, oh, it's because you want to drink and, and like have loads of sex and um, be crazy. And, you know, they just have this vision of like a crazy wild girl, which is so bad, like as if that's like the worst thing. Um, and in fact, coming out as a woman compared to like my husband or my dad um, is so different. It's so different because, you know, the hate that I get and the death threats that I get is nothing compared to what they get. And it always has become sexual. Like, it's, it's like we will, we will rape you and, um, you know, oh, I can't wait to find this girl so that I can, like, rape her and gang rape. Like, really vile things. Um, but yeah, you never see that with, with guys. Obviously, they get it as well, but not to the extent women do. Critical thinking stops when religion starts. You can think critically about every other topic, but the moment somebody starts with your religion, it ends, and especially one that is intolerant to being challenged. And, you know, despite people being engineers, when you start asking them, like, you know, when you start putting it back on reverse, why do you believe in God? Like, you know, there's no evidence for it. You're kind of, you're not being, I feel that you're not applying the same critical thinking that you do in your work when it comes to religion. There are always excuses. They've come to a point, it always comes to a point where those excuses don't make sense. Right? You can't, you know, the mental gymnastics played is just, it doesn't, it doesn't work anymore. So, you know, you come to a point where you're like, well, this doesn't make sense, what are you going to do about it? And they're like, no, but it's written in the book. So the whole thing always circulates around the Quran where they're like, the book is true. I don't think they realize that man, men have written the book. They think it's the authentic word of God, but where does it come from? Who writes it? So my father was um, put away for about 48 hours. My entire family had decided to say 
that this was just a one-time incident between myself, who was an adult at the time, and my father, and nothing had ever happened to the children, and that he was good with the children, and this was just a disagreement between me and my father. And they had completely covered up everything in the house. So they couldn't do anything with the children. Like, they are still currently living with him. Going through mental health myself, I can I know what it's like when you're around people but still isolated. I know what it's like living a double life. Um, you know, I was like I had to be a different person with my parents who wasn't like questioning religion versus another person who is questioning religion, scrutinizing it, being bold, but the attitude hurts my family. So I always had to be two different people and I know what it was like. I have been hiding my poetry for a very long time. Uh, at first I wasn't even sure if it's poetry, I was like, it's more like rap. And, 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 and where I come from, actually, it's, it's not very, com it's not even, you, you don't hear anybody with doing that, especially on the mainstream kind of stuff. Although Somalis have a traditional poetry kind of thing, but uh, mine, were, I was doing, I was writing in English, and so it's not something I could share. Um, but it was my healing area where I would express myself the things I couldn't say and I just put it down and I just hide it. Maybe uh, until now I my shouting is not really big. You know everything I did it until now all my activists I think until I feel I changed something in my society I will not stop I will not be happy I will not feel I did something. I will not. I want to stop them to hurt the women and the kinder and the ch children there. I want to remove the Islam from the law. I want really to separate it. I want to give a right for the women. You know, after I come to Germany and I start to have a simple right, like going to police if something happened to you, going out do your work, your study, traveling. Like now I am in Amsterdam, it's easy. Only you take your stuff and you go out. It was dream. You, can you imagine it's a dream for some girl? Because they have this Islam, this shit, sorry. Like when I had been put into a homeless shelter because the police actually did find me somewhere to stay for that night. The day after I had gone and gotten ready and I had gone to, because I was going to take a bus to the police station and I didn't know at that point that you, you had to use oysters because I just thought you could still pay a fare because I had not used a bus in that long. I didn't know that I had to have an oyster and the bus driver had told me that you need to get an oyster and I think he, he didn't know what was going on but then there wasn't a lot of time to explain so I got off, I went to uh, one of those like um, news agents. And it was a Muslim man behind the counter. And I was like, I need to get to the police station. And he, he was like, do you need an Oyster card? And I was like, yes. And he was like, okay, that costs five pounds. And I said, I don't have a lot of money. And he actually put money in the card for me. And I, like, I have gotten so much love and kindness from strangers that was never afforded to me by my own family. And I don't know how to feel about that. Um, so by healing, I mean, I couldn't talk about these things. There was nobody I could discuss these things with. And I could only write them down. So it was kind of like my diary, the, po the poetry. The hardest thing leaving Islam is definitely, um, is the, just the abandonment, the kind of abuse that you get. Um, you know, I, I, it's weird though, because I do think in some ways I'm, I'm grateful for it not being worse, but it's like we have such a low bar, um, because I know that it could have been kind of literally my own family wanting to kill me rather than abandon me. Um, so yeah, so it, it's weird, but I, I kind of have this feeling of, well, it could have been so much worse. I know that's almost a norm for many, for many kind of ex-Muslims to kind of have 
severe death threats from their family. The worst thing about becoming an ex-Muslim is um, being dehumanised by everybody else. Like there's there's the left that attack you for speaking against the like Islam, and then there's a the right that attack you or prey on you because you're speaking against Islam. And then there's the Muslim right, and then there's the Muslim left. Like we don't like ex-Muslims have never had this peaceful. You've left Islam. It's okay, even if you don't talk about it. We're always just people who are going to go to hell. We're always just people who are going to be, um, you know, we're just subjugated or we're prostitutes or that, you know, we we have no moral values because we don't have a religion. We don't, most of us don't believe in God. Um, and that's, you know, just the component of being dehumanized and just being a recipient of so much hate is possibly the worst thing for ex-Muslims. Because for a long time I was made to understand that my family are the only people in the world that I can trust. But they turned out to be the most untrustworthy people that I could have ever made contact with. Because they had didn't have my best interest at heart. They didn't have child my you know, the children's best interest at heart. They only had their own best interest. Then you lose all the people that you kind of depended on as well. Um, so you suddenly just feel so alone and lost. Um, but, but then at the same time, you kind of value, you value things more, like you value the people that love you for you and are there for you. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, as I said, I feel like I'm still in early stages. So I feel like I'm transitioning now to trying to see the good in it. But I mean, I spent, like, I couldn't get out of bed for like a week when when the video went up, you know, I just kind of was like stuck. I was just like, I can't come to work. I can't move. I didn't eat. I was just like frozen because I was like this. It just felt like my whole life was changed. Like, that's it. Um, you know, so it, it was very heartbreaking. It was very kind of like suddenly you feel like everyone hates you, um, which doesn't sound that bad. But when you experience it, it's really horrible. The best thing about leaving religion is being true to myself and knowing that I'm not alone. I feel, I find comfort in talking to other people who've had similar experiences. I find comfort in finally making a decision for myself versus waiting for somebody who possibly, does, like waiting for a being that doesn't exist. Um, I find it liberating to make my own decisions than a book guiding me. I think I have more power now than I ever did before. It's more freedom. I feel I am a woman, but not like the way how they see it for me. I am now equal to the man. I am now having my rights. I am now doing what I want. Finally, you know, after this all of years, I am doing what I want. No one can stop me. I feel like I'm responsible to make this also reality for other women, not only in Arab country, in all this world. I believe in the women now, I believe in the feminist movement, I believe in all women have to be activists, helping each other to change this world. We are bringing the children to this world, not the man, you know. The best part about leaving Islam is just the feeling of freedom in the sense of like, you know, I finally feel like I can be good to people. I know it sounds really weird, but like as a Muslim, I kind of felt like I had to not like gay people or be or like them, but just say to them that it's wrong. You know, you can't really do it. You're just going to have to live as a gay person and for the rest of your life and never be with anyone. Um, and I would, you know, tell people like you can't, you know, there's so many things that you can't do, all these restrictions. And now I feel like I can really just love people and just be like, do ever what the hell you want to do. And like, this is freedom. Like you can do what you want and be happy. And that's what matters. And being a good, a really a good person. People always say like goodness comes from religion. But it's like, no, if, if, if that was the case, then, you know, slavery would still be around and it would be fine and that would be good. Um, so, as I said, kind of that feeling of being what I think is just 
good person. Like even when I did things as a Muslim, you know, I did good things as a Muslim. I, you know, I gave in charity or I volunteered my time or I taught someone the Quran. It would feel good, but it, I wouldn't be happy about it. Like now I can pet a dog and just be happy about it. And I don't know how to explain that because it's an emotion. I feel like it's very abstract, but it's it's just this pure sense of joy that I just never felt as a Muslim. I never felt it, not once, doing anything. And I, yes, I felt aloof. I felt like I was the best possible human that I could be. I felt superior to everyone around me, but I never for once felt happy. And I think that that says a lot about being indoctrinated from a young age and just not knowing a lot of the world. Obviously, if you're in a Muslim bubble like I was, you're just hearing back, you know, it's like an echo. <laughs> you're just hearing back the same, they're like, yep. In fact, most of the time I heard kind of more extreme things coming back to me, like, oh, well, you can't do that, or you have to wear socks when you pray. It's like, oh, okay, okay. It's another another kind of extremist thing. Um, but yeah, when, when you go to university, for me, and I've heard this actually for quite a few people, that it's, you suddenly see all these different kinds of people. <laughs> Living in Australia was quite liberating because there were people who didn't expect me to wear hijab. It was a new identity that I had formed. People had never known me to wear hijab before. They, they, didn't, they wouldn't treat me differently because I wasn't wearing a hijab. Um, I, it was, it's a multicultural country, so I was introduced to more people that I didn't know from different faiths, mostly atheists, but different cultures. You know, even in this moment when I was in the middle of the sea between Turkey and Greece, I get feeling, even if I die in this moment, I am happy because I try to be free. I try to free myself. I try to have my rights, my freedom. I get the feeling and start to asking, but why I have to pay all this? Why it's really expensive? It's really hurts. It's really uh, broken you from inside. So yes, freedom cost me a lot, but at least I am satisfied that I am what I am. So now I can openly say, yes, I'm a woman and I'm a powerful. I can only hope she can find me uh, via social media or via Facebook. One day I might see her. I'm not sure there is very little hope because I know her father as well and my laws as well. So I don't know if they are letting her go to anywhere in order to, in order to meet me or search me from social media because they are really religious. I'm not sure if she's supposed to use uh, social media or Facebook as well. But yeah, there is still a little hope to meet her, to see her somewhere. So a mother can just see her daughter again. I feel now I, can, I don't care. I am, not an, I am not afraid anymore. I can go to maximum limit. No one can stop me now, you know? I feel really I can be even in politics, I can do something big because I believe now in myself. I am not afraid anymore. Sometimes they ask me when you criticize Islam all the time, you're not afraid to be killed. I told them, if you get afraid for one year, two years, three years, it's come the moment this feeling it's dying from inside. And that's happened to me. I don't have any regrets. No, I'm 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 okay with how I how I how I did things. I'm obviously okay with leaving Islam. I have my many reasons why, um, and I'm happy that I'm able to be a voice for people that aren't. As I said, I feel like you know I feel grateful in a way um, that I'm kind of not having people in my family who want to kill me. So I feel like because of that. I kind of have a duty to speak for people who do have that situation. I think it's made me more happier than I have, but it's it's always challenging. So I've been more I've been more content, and I, I find that to be more valuable than a temporary happiness because when you receive all the vile attacks, it always puts you down. I'm currently doing 
um, my bachelor's degree. So I'm currently studying and working and doing all my activism. Again, zero to 100 or nothing at all. Um, but I'm doing my degree currently in social psychology and I really, really want to work with young people. Um, and I, I, I think my ideal role would be to work with either young Muslim girls or young Muslim boys. Um, and I don't know how far I would get with young Muslim boys, but I also want to try my hand at de-radicalization. Like, I want to know how that works. Because I, I mean, my process of de-radicalization, I feel like, wasn't conventional, even though that's not a conventional thing. But it wasn't conventional because it was just strangers asking me the right questions and making me think. First of all, when you realize... Um when the guilt drops and you realize, okay, now I, I, I actually don't believe in it and there's nothing wrong with me not believing in it, then it has a free, freeing effect. And then that's the time now you want to do activism and you want to do something about it. I was already a journalist and so when I came to the Netherlands, I'm like, I'm going to find out. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to still do my poetry, I'm still going to be doing ex-Muslim activism, I'm still going to do something about FGM. And uh, I can't talk about it too much, but I'm very busy with a very big research right now. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> I can't go back. But now here, the situation is getting better. We are here in the Netherlands. I'm studying now. I'm studying international and European law. And uh, I'm in my second year now. And my husband, he's working. He's an IT consultation. Uh, so, uh, consultant, sorry. So he's working, we have a daughter now, we are getting back to the normal life, things are getting better. Even though we can't forget our past, that's still there. But we both, we do not talk to each other over past because it's, it's really hurting. So my husband, he also doesn't speak a single word over past and me too. But there is still something in our head. We know, we both know that we cannot go back to our, our country, but still we have hope. Okay, one day we could see our children, we could see them and we could tell them that what was the situation, why we are here, what we faced and what we sacrificed. And we can not do anything in this situation except to going forward, to move on, to go ahead and to live our lives with a little hope.